thank you. I need to do a bit of housekeeping because that's been bugging me from behind the scenes. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk to you about why data is the future of art. So if I ask you to think of a list of art materials, just in your head, what would you say? What would be the things you come up with? One of the first things people think about is probably paint and maybe pencils. Then people, we might consider wood or stone, bronze, many different types of traditional art materials that we could think of. And you might consider ceramics and maybe lino cut. And then if I pushed you far enough, you might even consider photography as, as an art material as well. But one of the things that you may not think about is data. And data is a really prolific art material. Many artists are working with it at the moment. But what, what is data? And why would an artist want to work with something that they can't feel, they can't smell, they can't touch? Well, data's a brilliant material. It can be, it comes in all different formats. It comes in different, different dynamics and different structures. And here's a taxonomy of data that, because I've been working with data for some time, I've been thinking about what is this material I'm working with? How does it come into being? And how is it generated? So things on the taxonomy are things like personal data, which is our medical records and our geolocation tracks recorded by our mobile phones. But there's also spatial data, which is how we map the world. And then anic data, anecdotal data that comes in uh, qualitative information that we collect. And then how does this data arrive? Is it in real time or is it historical? Do we have to go and get it? So these are the different types of data that artists are working with and they produce a whole range of different artworks. This is a very small selection of the artworks of artists that I've been working with and I've been studying. And from here you can see that there are, there are sculptures, there are screen-based artworks, and all of these use data in different ways. Some of them, the, the, the contraption down there in the corner, is a pneumatic contraption that takes council data and turns it into movement. So the councillors from Bristol City Council can actually sit on a pneumatic device and they can ride their own expenses. <laughs> One of the other works there that is worth pointing out is the vending machine. It doesn't really look like an expected artwork, but that vending machine has been hacked and it feeds from data from the BBC website. Every time the vending machine picks up news of a recession or a fiscal downturn, then it dispenses a packet of crisps. And the artist is looking at this idea of how we consume data. What does that mean? One of the things I'm really interested in in my work is this idea of life data. So data that comes from living things, biological data or data that comes from the environment. And I'm interested in data that comes into us in real time, so here and now. And for me to create artwork out of this kind of data gives the work a sense of nowness, a real urgency that makes it very exciting. And when I'm building this, the systems and the frameworks that, cre that, that are the foundations of my artwork, I then allow the data to sort of flow into them. And by doing that, I'm giving these life forms a way to express themselves through my artwork. And it also allows me to sort of take a step back to relinquish a bit of control from the final outwork, artwork. And when I switch on the things when they're finally ready, I don't actually know how the final thing is going to be. So there's an element of surprise that comes after sometimes 18 months of work that emerges from the program or from the software that I've developed. So I'll give you a few examples of this to make it a bit clearer. This is one project called The Lake, and this is inspired by the beauty of the movement of fish. And I've been a, a swimmer all my life, and I'm really quite obsessed with fish and, and, and their activities. And so I thought, how could we turn fish, the movement of fish, into music? Could fish make music? Can they create a flowing animation? So I found a lake, and I t put some tags inside a bunch of fish so that we could track their movement in their natural environment. And it was important they were in their own environment and not in a tank. And then I created an installation by the lakeside where you walked in and looked up and then 
you could experience the digital lake that I'd created. And I, I'll play you a clip now of the result of this. So the lake, what you can uh, sort of vaguely see on there is a, a, an, an animation of fish moving around. And as they move around, they play different sound samples and they kind of um, create a very um, sometimes ambient, sometimes very dynamic soundscape, which is generated by the fish in real time. This is a piece of work called T-Flock, and this is focused on the migration patterns of birds. And it occurred, you know, we, we know that climate change is affecting how birds migrate in their migratory routes. And I wanted to try and represent that data in a very physical way. And so I took the data from, tea, um, from birds that flock to tea growing countries, and I created a work, this is another video, of tiny teapots that flocked and migrated. And as you can see, the, at the moment, the, the, the little tiny teapots aren't flocking very well, they're doing their own thing. But then when they receive a certain stream of data, they all align and they head off in the right direction. And this is a way of physically representing data. Another piece of work is called Lepidopteral, and this again was inspired by the natural world. And I was in Italy and I found um, myself watching this whole group of tiny butterflies. And one of the things that occurred to me was we associate butterflies with fluttering around, but actually a lot of the time they just sit quite stationary and they will just flap their wings very gently. And so I wanted to try and emulate that in a piece of work where the work was very soft and very subtle, not a very mechanical piece, just very small. And here's a video of the, the butterflies that I was inspired by. This is a video as well of the actual, a close-up of the actual work. And if we can see some movement in there, you'll see that the, the wings just fold and open very gently. And it's a silent piece of work that is organic in nature, so it really represents the wildlife in real time. And the way that it, the, the work is triggered is by light levels in Berlin and in Lapland. So as the light fluctuates and changes, these little moth-like creatures slowly fold their wings. So data is all around us, and data is a really abundant art material. It's doubling, probably more than doubling every two years, the data that we generate, which is really phenomenal. And it's the most abundant art material we've ever created. One of the brilliant things about data is that it's linked. It can link many things together. So for me, the idea of how we connect to nature can be done by using these live data feeds to help us do that. We're so, our lives are so embedded in the screens that we need to find new ways of, of, of connecting with nature while we're behind them, because we're not out there all the time. And if we lose our connection with nature, then we just become further away from our own planet. But one of the things about creating these artworks is, especially if they're data-based and they're very screen-based, is how do we see them? How do we get audiences to look? So when you're thinking about trying to get an art fix, you might go to a gallery, or you might stumble across a major sculpture in a, in a public park, or you might encounter some great art at the airport, or there's street art. As you're wandering around, you might be confronted with an amazing piece of street art, or you might see you know, the murals that are around that all have a very strong message to send. So the challenge is, how do we do that? How do we replicate these cultural experiences online in our web browsers? And we spend so much time there. We've managed, to, um, we've managed to make shopping something acceptable to do online. And we can converse. We can watch films. All of these things happen within our screens. But what we're not very good at is having these cultural interventions, these art experiences. And what I'd like to see is, in between maybe buying a new pair of shoes, that a piece of artwork is on the screen as well. So it's as if I was walking down the high street and then I saw something in the gallery and I thought, I'll just pop in, get a, bit of, get a bit of an art experience, have a bit of time to contemplate something outside of my normal life. And I'd like to see that embedded into the internet, into the web, in a much better way than we do at the moment. 
So is data the future of art? Well, I think data is one of the futures of art. Certainly for me, I'm going to carry on working with this really incredible material. I find it inspiring. I find it super malleable. And it just can produce some wonderful art forms that help us reflect ourselves and our world back to us in different ways. It's one thing to produce a lot of data, but it's another thing to make sure that that data is reused and then we use it to see what the thing is that we're measuring and then we can take action on anything that needs to be changed. And also data can be used to help us see these works. If you think about the recommendation systems that are used online, wouldn't it be nice to have a thing that popped up and said, you're interested in super cooperation and fish. Wouldn't you like to see the lake? And then you can be whisked away into an online animation for a while before you get back on with your work. So I'm just going to leave you now, not with another video, <laughs> um, with a little sneak preview of the work that I'm creating at the moment. And the work is called We Need Us. And it's based on, uh, it's inspired by a website called Zooniverse. And Zooniverse is a citizen science website. It is a repository of vast data sets about all different things that scientists have put there. And the scientists need some human classification to happen. It can't be done by machines. So they developed this website. And there's material on there from galaxies colliding, to cancer cell structures, to worms laying eggs, to whale songs, a whole raft of, of different types of data. And what really amazed me and made me want to work with it was that over a million people are altruistically donating their time to this website, and they are classifying data to further the development of science. And this is just people all over the world that are just interested in what's happening. So I decided to take the data from the people, so it's the metadata of the people classifying the data, and to create a sound piece and an animation that reflects the energy of that altruistic nature of humans and how they like to help to further the world. So these are some of the screenshots of the animation. And all of these shapes that you can see will be moving and then playing sound, so there'll be sort of like a musical representation of the data. And one of the things I decided to do, which is relatively radical for an artist, is that because all of the data I'm collecting is open, because it's all just out there without any copyright, I've decided to open source the code to the work. So the entire artwork will be able, people will be able to download it, they'll be able to hack it, they'll be able to remix it. And more importantly, and this is one thing that really needs to happen in the online world, they'll be able to share it. Thank you very much.